Now, a lot of us have been waiting for news with the Idaho 4. Let's just call it what it is. There's not any real news. Yes, there is a trial date, which is June of 2025. And until June of 2025, we probably aren't going to have any real news when it comes to the Idaho 4. However, recently, it does seem that there's a lot of grifting going on. We talked about Howard Blum in our last video when it comes to the Idaho 4. And today, we're going to talk about him again. But we're also going to talk about Steve Gonzalez. Because it seems that everybody is trying to make a buck off of those dead kids. And of course, demonizing Brian Kohlberger. While the real killer probably is out here still running around. I'm JB Gunner. This crime time. Let's get into it. Bring it back. What's going on, everybody? As you guys know, I'm JB Gunner, and this is Crime Time. Been a while, ain't it? But we are back here today. Guys, before we get into this story, I want to first and foremost say thank you to everybody that supports the channel. Hell, any of my channels, regardless of platform and regardless of method you use, whether it's Cash App, Patreon, Venmo, PayPal. Truth is, guys, I couldn't do this each and every day as often as I do for the last 18 years. If it wasn't for you, the Gun Squad. Love you guys. Thank you very much for all your support. And if you too find my content valuable, feel free to hit the links down below. Join the Gun Squad today. Guys, we're going to get into some goofy shit. For you guys that don't know, I'm still on vacation, working vacation for a year, and uh, doing my thing off in Florida, enjoying life. Uh, but... We do have a little bit to report on here, some videos to show you, because the show, look, Nancy Grace, Howard Blum, all these motherfuckers, because there's no real news, even Megyn Kelly jumped on this shit. They're, they're doing everything they can to promote, to promote Howard Blum's fictional tale of what happened. How do I know it's fictional? Because there's a gag order and there's no fucking way he could know the shit that he claims to know. What does he claim to know? Well, we're going to get into that in this video. But also, some news came out. And if Howard Blum is telling the truth, then that means the Steve Gonsalves, the father of Kaylee Gonsalves, is in the process of making a film regarding the Idaho 4. See, us people that report news on YouTube and provide commentary, we get called grifters all the time. Let's see if you motherfuckers out there have that same energy for Steve Gonsalves' ass. Let's see if you guys have that same energy for Nancy Grace's ass. Let's see if you have that same energy for Howard Bloom's ass. Chances are you don't. Chances are because you disagree with people like me and Harsh for actually believing in guilt, uh, innocent until proven guilty, you'll still just call us the grifters, even though I barely even post on this page. Yeah, it is because there's no money to be made over in this motherfucker. But the truth of this is, is just because someone gets wants to get paid for their work, you assume it's grifting. I don't think you motherfuckers even know what the word grifting means. I genuinely don't. But anyway, let's go ahead and move on to this because we got some things to talk about. Wrong page. This one's the one. Let's go ahead and move on because uh, because we got a few videos I want to take a look at. A lot of this is about Howard Blum, but if you listen, you'll see some of the accusations he's making. There's no um, there's no there's no base to there's no reality to. Howard Blum, if you guys remember right, when Howard Blum used to write all of his articles, it sounded like he was writing a novel. And that's exactly what he wrote. He says it's not nonfiction, but no, I believe it's 100% fiction. I believe he's sprinkling in some truths from the PCA into this shit, but there's things that, that he claims that he makes that he couldn't possibly know unless he's talked to the Koberger family. And let's just be perfectly honest. People like Steve Gonzalez just came out and said, man, Blum has never talked to us. I'm just being dead honest. I think Howard Blum is, the, is writing fiction, but selling it to you guys as if it's nonfiction. And people like Nancy Grace and Megyn Kelly and Cooper Duper, they just keep rolling with it as if this man knows what he's talking about. Anyway, author claims book on Brian Kohlberger is nonfiction. Let's take a listen. A controversial new book on the Idaho student murders claims that one of the four college students killed was targeted. But the family of one victim calls it pure fiction, claiming the author never spoke to them. 
Bingo. Pure fiction. Never talk to us. That's what they said. By the way, obviously, there was probably one person targeted. Let's just be honest. The, in all reality, the likelihood is there was a target, a specific person that led to all of this. I highly, unless this was a random serial killing, I highly doubt that all four of them knew the killer. Do you see them, all six of them in the house? It's possible. But in, in all reality, this was probably just some random serial killing or a drug deal gone bad or potentially some shit from the frat. I don't know. But there is a high likelihood, whether Ethan was the target, Kaylee Gonzalez was the target, Maddie, there's a, a good chance, that's just common sense, that there was one individual that stands out as the origin target in this entire situation. Our Bloom's new book, When the Night Comes Falling, traces the months leading up to the murders. The book claims Madison Mojan was the original target. Did none of these motherfuckers ever know how to pronounce anybody's name. Who the fuck is Madison Mojan? <laughs> of suspect Brian Koberger. This, as Koberger's trial, is now set to begin June 2nd of next year. June 2nd. Dr. Howard Bloom is here to answer some of those questions and the criticism. Thank you so much for joining me this morning on Morning in America. Good to speak with you. Absolutely. I've had an opportunity to watch and, and read some of your book there. He's um, lying. But before we get into your reporting, I <laughs> this motherfucker said, I've had an opportunity to watch and read something. Stop it. Stop it. Uh, to touch on the reaction from the parents. This goddamn Tyrone ain't read a guy, ain't read a single Howard Blum book, and he knows it. He knows it. He just this is what the media does. They're all it's all fake news. The victim, uh, Kaylee Goncalves. Goncalves. Your book is based. These on motherfuckers still pronounce her name wrong. Conjecture and say, "quote All this book does is tell a story by Mr. Bloom, a version made, made up, up by, by him, him, relying on sources that." have no responsibility or duty to exactly. speak the truth. Mr. Bloom, what's your response exactly. to you? Exactly. The Gonsalves family said Howard Bloom is full of shit. Because for being a journalist and a writer, you've never talked to the Gonsalves family? This should tell you everything you need to know. And, and here's why. Because the Gonsalves family has been everywhere. Steve Gonsalves has been in every media. He does every interview. So for you to not talk to Gonzalez, that means you probably didn't even reach out. Not really. Shit, Harsh Reality has talked to Steve Gonzalez before. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Harsh Reality. And that's not a knock on Harsh Reality, but what it means is that's a YouTuber. You're an esteemed author, Howard Bloom. You're an esteemed author, right? the family and to critics concerned about your presentation of the facts. Well, first I want to say about Mr. Goncalves Good and calls. the family, you know, my heart goes out to, to them. I mean, how can, I don't want to get into a, 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 a match going back and forth against a father who lost his match. daughter. I'm a father of three children, uh, a father, you know, he went and talked to the press and so said, you sent your daughter guy. off to college. She comes back to you in an urn. How can one go back and forth with him? However, let me direct some of the things he says. I say quite clearly in the book, I didn't speak with him. I did speak with his lawyer. I spoke with very many people. But spoke he doesn't go to any specific facts that are wrong. He testified many times on television. He's, from the beginning, he's criticized the police involved. Right. He seems to be criticizing everyone involved. And again, I understand. Yes, he's criticizing everyone involved because all of you cocksuckers are liars. You claim to have information from the grand jury proceedings that was closed, that was gagged. I don't believe you. And that in my, in my book, I shape him as a rather heroic figure, someone who refuses to let his daughter's death path pass without retribution without getting to the bottom of the th things. And I point out quite clearly how Steve has dug and dug and dug. I quote directly from the text he has sent. Uh, I quote directly from his interviews. He hasn't challenged any of the text or any of the interviews. And I think, to be candid, there's another... I want you to understand what his position is. His position is Steve Gonsalves 
isn't challenging any of the things I said. Yes, he is. He called your, your everything you say fiction. That means not true. He said you made up everything. That means he's challenging you, dummy. Involved in all of this. Money. Money. I was approached by uh, the Gun Clavis lawyer on right. a, a movie deal. I considered this involving them in my movie deal. I decided I didn't want to go that way. I was trained. To so now this cocksucker is throwing Steve under the bus, saying his lawyer's out here shopping for a movie, wanting to know if you wanted to be involved. Why would... <laughs> Let's just say that's true for just a couple seconds, okay? You're like, nah, because I'm writing a book. Now, he did throw Steve under the bus. And if Steve is shopping, and Steve's lawyer is shopping for a movie deal, that is disgusting. Because they didn't say documentary. Do you hear what I'm saying? That he didn't say documentary. This motherfucker said movie. Remember the, the Lifetime movie or whatever it was that they did on on um, uh, Potato, Gabby Potato? Remember that shit? I know it's Potato. Stop. You say, why do you got disrespect at Jimmy? Shut your mouth. Whatever, man. Either laugh or move the fuck on. I think that's what the type of deal that they're shopping for. That's the type of movie they're talking about. Some sort of lifetime movie for all the fat bitches with, 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 with greasy fingertips and, and ho-hos and shit dribbling out of their, their gullet. That's what they're trying to do. Is, is entertain all them motherfuckers sitting at home all day. Let's get back to this. Which is still disgusting. It's still disgusting. This case isn't even solved yet. And motherfuckers is writing books and doing movie deals and shit. I was a New York Times reporter. I was nominated for two Pulitzers at the New York Times. Who gives a fuck? The Times ethic is you don't pay for information, and it just didn't fit right for me. Don't pay that, for information. A, a movie deal, a book deal with someone else, is that an element in all this? I don't know. So this cocksucker is, is saying that other people are grifting, but he's not. It's ethics. New York, Pulitzer Prize. We don't pay for information. <laughs> Is he throwing Gonzalez under the bus? Both of these motherfuckers. Both of these motherfuckers are, are hungry for attention. Gonzalez and Bloom. At least Gonzalez has somewhat of a reason to do it because his fucking daughter died. No, oh, but it, I was approached. And I also will say these attacks are dangerous. Dangerous? Uh, you know, he's writing a book about a killing. Well, there have been people who have been... The uproar against me, the uproar against people associated with me at Harper Collins is a dangerous situation he is creating. And also <laughs> now he's saying Steve Gonzalez is creating danger. He's, you can tell this is a libtard. Your words are violent, Steve. <laughs> I hate these people. I'm on the same page with him in many events. I wrote about the delay in, in the trial. I wrote an op-ed editorial in the Washington Post. Well, four days later after that, there, the judge finally sets a trial date. I'm oh. on his side, but I think he wants to control this story. Did he just insinuate that the judge set a trial date because Bloom wrote an article? Stop. And I'm sorry, there's a free press and we report on events. And if he doesn't like it, let him talk to specific facts and we'll engage with that. Mr. Bloom, you know I've got to ask you a couple of questions before I get you out of here. Um, I'm glad to hear that you say that you're not competing with Father, then you empathize right. with what he's going through right, right now. Um, just there are no shortage of people trying to cash in on all of this. In your book, though, you talk about how you believe... I don't think cash in is the right word. <laughs> of course, because you're cashing in on it. Listen, man. Why do you think I make these videos? Pay me, motherfuckers. If you'd like to be entertained, pay me. And I'll do it more. Why do I not do more videos here? Because motherfuckers here, everybody in the true crime community acts like we're all on some sort of mission, some sort of yeah, quest for truth and honesty and, 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 and justice for the victims. Everybody here acts like they're fucking detectives sitting there with nacho cheese oozing out of their, their nose. I'm one of the only people that sit here and say, no, I get paid to entertain you. And if I, if I don't get paid, then I don't feel like entertaining you. If you'd like to pay me for entertaining you, feel free to hit the links down below.
and I gladly will post more videos. Along with your, your donation, you can always request a video, and I will make it that very day. That's the truth. See, unlike these motherfuckers, I owe, and I'm glad Horse is starting to openly talk about he gets paid. Because that's the truth. I get paid, Horse gets paid, Gonsalves, no, I don't know if Gonsalves is, well, he's trying to get paid. Nancy Grace gets paid, Coop and Pooper gets paid, Howard Bloom gets paid, and everybody's trying to get paid because that's what news people do. That's what commentators do. If we, why would we do this for free? So we can talk to you people right now on your couch? You want me to do this for free to talk to you while you're sitting there with jelly donuts shoved up your ass? No! No! Wait for your husband to get home, you fat bitch, and talk to that motherfucker. Man, let that motherfucker be your friend. I ain't trying to be your friend. I'm not sitting here trying to flirt with, well, if you're hot, I'm trying to flirt with you. But I'm not sitting here trying to be your friend unless you plan on sucking my dick or paying me. That's the truth. And that's their truth. I'm just one of the only people that openly admit it. That's reality. Let's get to it. Reporting on the story. Are you cashing in on the events that you, you, you covered, the child's report? I really resent that. I find that's a derogatory Look, remark. Shut your ass up. Is, is a work of narrative, nonfiction. It has literary standards and, and journalistic right. standards. And cashing in is, is a wrong way. I, I've written You're selling the book. You are cashing in. We're all cashing in. That's what news people and journalists and media personalities do. We cash in. In 16 books, I tell stories, and none of them ever were intent to cash in. Bullshit! You sold them all. This is what we do. We cash in, and the people that like this type of content, whether it's reading it, watching it, whether they're watching True TV, whatever... They're the consumers. They're the ones that pay for this type of content. They are entertained by true crime, 48 hours type of content. It's not that hard to understand. Attempt to do a writer's and a journalist's job. Mr. Bloom, it was not my intention to offend you, but I do want Fuck to get him. your reaction, though. You talked about at one point in your book, I do want to talk about this. Fuck you it. Talk about how you believe that Mr. Kobarger's father possibly knew something was wrong. How would he how know? How did you come to that conclusion when you talk about that? How in would he book, know? When the night comes falling. I spoke to relatives who spoke with Mr. Kobarger's father. Right. What the FBI did is they put up, they created a family tree which led them to the Kobergers. I did the reverse. I walked back on that family tree and spoke to these relatives, and they gave me information about what people were saying and also people in the community in Pennsylvania. Thanks for watching. He said he talked to relatives in the family. And let me tell you something. We can go back in time, and I can tell you exactly probably the relative he's talking about. The aunt who hadn't seen Kohlberger in years. But when Kohlberger had seen her, she made a big deal because he didn't want to eat out of out of pots and pans that cooked meat. He's a, he's one of them homo vegans, man. It is what it is. And I ain't got no hatred for you vegans. I think you're weird and gay. But you're in way better shape than me, so clearly, clearly, you got it figured out. I just ain't willing to be that faggoty to not sit here and eat meat or or whatever the fuck you people do. I understand it's more than not eating meat. That's vegan. That's vegetarianism. But vegans do a lot of the same gay shit. Vegans do a lot of the same gay shit. And listen, that's on you. And you know what? It clearly, for a lot of you, keeps you healthy. So maybe you know more than me. I just know that I'm a dude with a dick. I like to drink beer and eat meat. And, and, and fuck. I ain't gonna say I ain't doing it. Let's go ahead, because Inside Edition is saying, did the sister of the Idaho murder suspect fear he was the killer? Do you see what they're trying to do? They're trying to point it all as if Kohlberger's family somehow is the ones talking. That aunt that probably Bloom talked to, that's all. That's probably all she said. Yeah, he was, he was a weirdo. That motherfucker didn't eat off the dishes. That's probably all she said. And him being a fiction writer, he, he's going to come out here and he's going to blow that shit up. Let's listen to Inside Edition. 
new book about the murder of four University of Idaho students with the focus on the suspect in the case, Brian Koberger and his family. Right. In the days after the slayings, were they suspicious were that he could they? be the killer? Here's Jim Murray. Long before cops charged Brian Koberger with the murders of four University of Idaho students, his own family feared he How was the know? killer. How do you know? The facts are there. It doesn't take <laughs> too much genius to start having... No, this. no, dickhead. You need to tell us the facts. Tell us the facts. What facts prove that the family thought it was him? Suspicions. Author Howard Bloom says in He's his new book, sucker. When the Night Comes Falling, that Koberger's sister became convinced he was the killer after police right. launched a nationwide search right. for a white Elantra like his. You know they're looking for a white car. You know your brother lives. So, So did you talk to the sister? Is that what you're saying? Just spit it out. Because if you didn't talk to the sister, I understand you claim to have talked to a family member, but if you didn't talk to the sister, then how the fuck would you know that? And guys, let me ask you a question. What is the odds that Brian Kohlberger's sister talked to Howard Bloom? What are the odds? Do you really believe that to be the case? Lives 10 miles away from the house where four people were killed. You know your brother has had psychological problems. You have to connect all the dots. No. The book claims that Stop the sister confronted their father with her worst fears. How would they know she this? She believed that Brian was behind the murders that How? the whole country was fixated on. How would on. they know this? But her father turned his back and walked away. Oh. But Michael Koberger also became suspicious, especially. Now the sister, the sister became suspicious, confronted the father, the father said, nah, bitch, and walked away. How would anyone know this unless you're saying you talked to the sister, which he did not say? All he's got to do, listen, is come out and say it. That's all he's got to do. And I don't want to hear that, none of that I don't want to give the sources up because there's only so many people that would have that kind of inside track. And clearly, <clears throat> you're insinuating that it's the sister. So come out and say Yes, I talked to the sister, but you won't because you didn't. He went on a 2,500 mile drive across country with his son. Cops pulled them over twice. So you're coming from Washington State University? We're slightly clutching to the drive for hours. He thinks this is it. And he begins you to hear? fear, as it was explained to me, what will be waiting for his son right. and his family at the other end of America when they finally... So now Howard Bloom is claiming that Brian Koberger's father believed it right there in that video, that Koberger was guilty and was concerned about what's going to happen when we get home. You're lying. Make this trip home. 15 days later, SWAT teams Making it completely the family up. home in Pennsylvania. They found Koberger at about two in the morning, sitting in the kitchen, and what he was doing, he was sorting through his own personal garbage, putting it into plastic bags that he could, could put someplace else, so with the belief that the police could never get his DNA, perhaps they couldn't uh, track him down. Today, Koberger appears hollow-eyed and gaunt, hard to believe. He once weighed over 300 pounds. He loses 130 pounds, approximately, in high school. Then he builds his body up. He has right. a stomach, Talk surgery. He has dreams of becoming a, a player. But he remained alone dreams of, with demons. Dreams of becoming a uh, uh, Dreams of God damn it. Dreams of becoming a player. The fuck is that supposed to mean? You see this cocksucker keeps going, and of course he's going over on Nancy Grace. Now from Manhattan along with an all-star panel to dissect what we know and what we are learning from Howard Bloom. You know, I have poured over right. every document, every search warrant, every return, every witness statement that I could get my mitts on. I have flown to Idaho, uh, to Moscow, well, good Idaho, you, bitch. in the midst of winter and trudged through the snow to look at the scene as best as I could to drive the route, I shit. believe. Oh yeah, good times. You didn't trust do shit. You sat there with that goofy ass table. You you weren't walking around on boots on the ground. You had a whole production staff there with you. You parked right there on that little side street and just, you didn't trudge anywhere. 
There was tape around the place. You didn't go inside. You didn't do any of that. This is so fucking garbage. Freezing. Um, then got in a, a, an SUV at night Ooh. in the pitch dark Ooh. at the time, I believe, Brian Koberger left that crime scene and started his circuitous route, although an hour's drive to his apartment at nearby Washington State University in Pullman, which should have been about an eight-minute drive. And somewhere along the way, he turns his cell phone back on. That said, after all that, I still learned so much. Because you didn't do shit, bitch. You drove the route. Quit acting like you was doing some sort of deep dive investigation. You did what, there's YouTubers out here that did more. JLR did more than that. I don't like the little fucker, but he did more than that. From reading Howard Way more than Bloom's that. book. The name, When the Night Comes Falling, A Requiem for the Idaho Student Murders. Right. Wow. Right. Even the title made me stop. And in the midst of everything we all do in regular life, you know, working, your children, your cat, your dog, your mom. Shut up. I managed to finish this book in one day. I practically could not put it down. Uh, I had it in two forms. I printed out what I had and had it on my iPad so I could look at it no matter where I was. <sighs> Howard Bloom... It's amazing. You had me sitting in the Costco parking lot in the heat. Yeah, it's like she goes to Costco. your book, trying to get to the next chapter before I came back home. It's amazing. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, That's very kind. You, you, know, you sit in your room as, as an author, and you wonder if anyone will read what you write, meant to hear someone uh, talk about it so graciously. You're a fucking jackass. You wrote about the hottest story in America. Of course people wrote about it. You're going to read it. I'm, I'm very flattered, so thank you. Well, I've never been accused of being kind before, so I, I will take that with a box of salt. I want to get right to it. There's so much in your book. I, I had to take copious notes. So I'll just start at the beginning. It was an amazing intro, and I, I was struck by the fact that you start your book from Koberger's father's point of view. How the fuck would he and know? And what I learned about his father really touched my heart. How he never he touched his heart. How the fuck would he know a shit about Koberger's dad? Stop this bullshit. Got to go to college and he was so proud of Brian Koberger and was already referring to him as Dr. Koberger right. amongst his co-workers. Right. And it reminded me so much, Howard, of my father. How he didn't get, we're first generation college. And when I got through law school, in his mind, it was the most amazing thing ever. So proud, right? <sighs> now, here's my question with that lead up. Almost at the beginning, his father and his family, Koberger's family, suspected him of being the killer. Bullshit. And I found that just. Bullshit. Let me tell you, let me ask you guys something. If you suspected someone in your family of being a killer, so much so you're willing to talk about it, would you be like, hey, son, hey, brother, come on back here for the holidays. Let's chill out for a couple weeks. Probably not, right? Probably not, right? Just saying. I, I, I was dumbstruck. Because, you know, when I read about a crime, I don't immediately think, oh, my son did that. In fact, I've never thought that. Tell me your thinking. And they and didn't make it. He's that. lying. They're lying. Michael Kohlberger makes this trip out to see his son to make the ride back with him. You know, this is a 28-year-old man, and his father is worried about him. He's making this trip. It's fatiguing. It's expensive. But he's worried about his son. He's sitting next to him in this car, shoulder to shoulder. He knows the police are looking for a white Hyundai. And one of the first things he, he realizes when he meets his son 
is that his son's mood is volatile. That's his first sign uh, that Brian is... How does he know any of this? He goes out to meet his son in Washington State, and he doesn't know which Brian he's going to encounter. But that's his first sign, and he begins to see as his mood, the moods change and become deeper and more acerbic. He begins to wonder, oh my gosh. You can tell this is a novel writer. He's just making this shit up. Look how, de- look how deep he's getting into the dad's psyche. And he's never even talked to the fucking dad. He begins to think the unthinkable. He begins to consider that his son could, in fact, be a murderer. And all this is building, building in his mind. He's afraid to go there, him? as any father would. You hear him? You hear him? And then ultimately, we got Inside Edition now. Was the Idaho murder suspect obsessed with one of the victims? See, this is the damage that Howard Bloom's book being written before the trial date even happens. This is the damage right here. This is why Brian Koberger, this, these charges need to be dismissed. He cannot get a fair trial because of bullshit just like this. This killer of the four University of Idaho students have a deadly obsession with one of the victims. A new book claims 21-year-old senior Madison Mogan was the real target of suspect Brian Koberger. And that became, I believe, an obsession for him. Chilling revelations about the murders are detailed in When the Night Comes Fall. An obsession for him. Now, remember, court documents say that there's no connection between Brian Koberger and the victims. None. Absolutely none. By former New York Times reporter Howard Bloom. You believe that this was a targeted killing. Why do you say that? He enters the house through the kitchen door. How do you know? If he was just on a killing spree, he could have gone into any of the two bedrooms on the second floor, and he would have found victims there. But instead, he goes up to the third floor into Maddie's bedroom. He believes Koberger first saw Maddie at the Mad Greek restaurant off campus. How do you know? She worked as a waitress there. I don't think they even needed to have a conversation for him, the way his mind worked, to become obsessed with this. Do you see what he's doing? He's now saying, yeah, there's no connection. They never talked, but they didn't need to because Koberger was such a killer. You see what's going on, right? Maddie and her friends posted these videos on TikTok, although it's not known if Koberger watched them. But it's believed that he staked out the house where the girls held lively parties. You know why we're here? Um, I assume noise. You might have seen Koberger in his car peering at these festivities, peering at this exuberance, and seeing all that he was cut Listen, off from. All that, all that he was caught off from. So this dude with an education in criminology saw a house with all these parties and said, yeah, that's the one I'm going to go in and target one person. And how do you know he was cut off from it? How do you know Brian Koberger was cut off from parties? Wasn't he at pool parties and shit? There's been plenty of, plenty of people talking about Koberger going, I, every, every picture I ever saw of Koberger for the most part was him smiling with friends and at parties and in the backseat of cars with friends and this is all bullshit. Ever be part of his life. According to Blue, you know? after Maddie was stabbed to death, her friend Kaylee Gonsalves, who was sleeping in the same room, woke up and tried to flee but was cornered. Right. As the killer moved to the second floor, he was confronted by the third victim, 20-year-old Ethan Chapin. He then killed Ethan's sobbing girlfriend, Zana Kernodal. One mysterious aspect about the tragedy. Yes. So, so Kernodal was the one up eating food, maybe, and scrolling TikTok. But yet it was Ethan, the one that was checking on him. It's possible. But how would he know? Involves the two young roommates who were living in the house but were left unharmed. Yet for some reason, they did not call police for eight hours. Right. According to the book, the two surviving roommates were actually texting during and after the murders. Roommate Dylan Mortensen even saw the killer when she opened her door course, to see what she was did. going on. She's frozen in shock. Her inability. Frozen to- in frozen shock phase, of course. Even scream is what saves her life. Oh. We'll so she our- was frozen in shock. Her inability to scream. She was just frozen for eight hours, Bloom. <laughs> Stop. 
Interview tomorrow. Meantime, Koberger, who has pled not guilty, is due in court for a hearing on Thursday. A trial is not expected until sometime next these year. People are complete, these people are complete clowns. And it goes even farther. Is, is Brian Koberger's defense attorney scared of him? Now they're claiming that Ann Taylor's scared of Koberger. Listen. Defense is the appearance that his counsel truly believes he is innocent. Ann Taylor and her assistants have said I that they listen. support Kohlberger. But body language experts say Taylor's positioning far away from Kohlberger suggests... Guys, if anybody... Listen, I understand a lot of you guys have never been in trouble or been to court or been to trial. No, everybody's defense attorney sits a in the other chair. Nobody's defense attorney sits on your lap. And if you take a look back over here, that's all that is. She's actually leaning into Kohlberger, not leaning away from Kohlberger. She's got her chair facing this way and she's leaning into Kohlberger. But listen to these idiots. Otherwise, some even say it looks like Taylor fears Kohlberger. Right. However, their attorney-client relationship shows improvement, with Kohlberger breaking shows, his usual stare during conversation with Taylor to crack a smile. You can't make this shit up. We've seen throughout history, and I'm going to go to Brian C. Stewart, a high-profile lawyer, lawyer joining us make out this of shit the jurisdiction up. of Idaho. Nancy he Grace and her bullshit. Parker and McConkel. Um, Here they go. Question to you, Brian. We have watched the body language in the courtroom from the get-go. And, and let me show you a few shots just off the top of my head. <laughs> Here we go. For instance, uh, oh, there they are. Yeah. On earlier court dates when they were... How much, how much closer can the motherfuckers get without having sex? Still sitting together. That's one of the first court dates ever. The courtroom body language, Brian Stewart, is conveyed to a jury. It's nonverbal, but it's very clear. These and motherfuckers. Ann Taylor in the Koberger case inching further and further and further. No, she's not. Those chairs are in the spots that they were in when they walked into the courtroom, dummy. Away from Koberger. Gee, I wonder why. Well, that's because right now she's facing the judge, talking to the judge. When she's talking to Koberger, she told, she directs the chair facing Koberger and leans in. God damn, you people are dumb. Weigh in. Well, there's, there's no people question are that dumb. the proximity and relationship that a defense attorney exhibits towards their client uh, gives the perception of what the, that defense attorney actually believes about the client, whether or not they're dangerous These or safe. These people have lost their goddamn minds. And, and even setting the, the defense lawyer's actual beliefs aside, a seasoned defense lawyer is going to know These that people that have lost their goddamn mind. The trial, even in motion hearings, as well as at trial, that they're always being observed and, and always sending a message of how they feel about their client. Joining us right now, special guest Tracy Brown, body language expert sure, I author bet. Of how to detect lies fraud and identity theft and you can find her at body language training i'll tell you what that bitch's body language says you can take one look at that bitch and know she owns about six or seven fucking cats you can take one look at this goofy wide-eyed bitch and know that she just she, that's what she does every day she goes to work she comes home she got the little saucer bowl which puts the little milk in here, kitty, kitty, this is what this stupid bitch does. You can tell I, I, I'm a body language expert, clearly. .com. Tracy, it's great to have you. I wanted you to see the various photos and see Koberger with his lawyer. <laughs> Tracy, I was <coughs> looking, actually, I bet you at Koberger's outfits. <laughs> and I was comparing <laughs> one suit to the next, to the next, to the next, to right. the next. And I noticed he always wore the same tie. And as I was looking at... Well, excuse me. He's in jail. It's not like he can go sh tie shopping, bitch. That, you know, does his demeanor change? Does his um, strut into the courtroom change? Because... I will never forget Scott Peterson. Every day he would walk into the courtroom all puffed up like this, very cocky, like a star football player, 
and literally strut over to the defense table. And I, I, and? I, I didn't think that was a good look for the jury. But I've been well, how do, you, how do you want a motherfucker to walk in there? Chin Koberger's gait, uh, his demeanor, who he looks for in the courtroom, where does he look first, how does he seat himself, where does he seat himself? He sits himself where he's supposed to sit himself, at the defense table, dummy! Uh, is he relaxed? Is he smiling? There's a lot of creepy grins going on. But then I began to notice, Tracy, These the distance. I, I, I guarantee right. you, after tonight, it won't happen again. But there has been a growing distance and frigidity between his defense attorney and him. And I'd like you, These people are fucking studied nuts. his These people are fucking nuts. and his movements in court, to give us your assessment. Well, what I see is when he walks in, he's super stiff. So either he hasn't been... <laughs> Aren't we all a little stiffy once in a while, especially in the mornings? Aren't we all... And moving, like while he's in jail, which is possible, or yeah. um, it's it's a, maybe a subset of fear running through his body, which... Uh, yeah, would, yeah, I'd say so since he's facing the goddamn death penalty be a reasonable thing to think. Now, as the distance grows, right, that scared. says emotional separation, and uh, they definitely do not have a close relationship, him and his, and his lawyer. Now, um, here's what I noticed that was really interesting in the video that your team sent me, is um, when they left the courtroom. Well, to be fair, she's a public defender. They didn't know each other until this case started. So no, they, they haven't built up their relationship over decades. The team, he, he, he left and he got out of there. And the rest of the team was still back at the table. And that tells Well, yes, because he has to go back to his cell, dummy. Do, do you hear what this bitch just said? That after the court case, Brian Coburn got the fuck out of there and left the defense at the table. Yeah, because he had to go back to his cell. That's what happens when you're locked the fuck up. You don't get to hang out and go outside for a cigarette or out to lunch. You have to go back to your jail cell. These dumb motherfuckers. It's me that he has not necessarily accepted his lawyer as the unconscious leader of the group. Right. Because if that was the case, they would they would rise and he would wait for them and These they people would leave are, together. So people. that really struck me as He can't leave together. She's going home, dummy. Interesting. They are not a tight unit team at all. This motherfucker said that they're not a tight knit team because Brian Koberger doesn't leave with Ann Taylor. He can't because they go through different doors. Heard uh, Kelly Gonzalez. We got, we got more, we Nancy heard. Grace. Uh, Kelly Gonzalez's parents speaking who's, out. Who's Kelly? She was this bitch said Kelly Gonzalez. Earlier, we heard from Kelly Gonzalez's parents. The target. And I understand that because her wounds were so much more heinous than Maddie's. But according to this new bombshell theory, God, she's Maddie thick. was in she's fact thick as well. the target. Also, we are learning from Howard Bloom's new book, When the Night Comes Falling, that there is blood evidence that Ethan evidence. Chapin oh. jumped up. Jumped up. And confronted <laughs> Ryan Hoberger <laughs> yeah. to protect his sweetheart. You're not going to kill my bitch, Ugh, jugular cut. Sorry, I'm out of the can't help you. And then Koberger was like, what they're saying is, I'm here to help you. These people are fiction writers. Zana Kernodal. To Howard Bloom, I, I know that you have researched this so much right. that it may have become, you know, SOP to you. But to us, the revelations that you make in your book are, let me just say, illuminating. Tell me the facts that support your theory that... Ethan was stabbed as he was trying to protect. Ma this is this is that new as shit. He was trying to protect Zana. This is that new shit right and here. And that after he attacked Ethan, he goes and says, "Don't worry, I'm here to help you." 
to Xana right. and then kills her. What facts support your theory? Ethan coming up to confront Koberger is was testimony that was made to the grand jury. Grand jury. jury. It's also evidence. So the grand jury, there was testimony that Ethan got up to fight Brian Koberger. Dog, you ain't about to kill my girl. <laughs> Dead. Bro, stop it. Stop it. Grand jury. How would he know grand jury testimony in the middle of a gag order? In, in the coroner's report that was shared at the coroner's grand report, jury, of course. That he was killed with a one massive cut to his neck that caught his jugular vein. Has to Zena speaking out? Who's Zena? Uh, uh, first saying there's someone here, and then the the, assail, the assailant saying, "I don't worry, I've come to help you." That's in the police documents. I think they didn't say that Zana said someone's here. They said that they heard that someone from upstairs said that someone's here. That's arguably one of the most chilling parts of this entire uh, night. The suspect approaching Zana and saying, don't worry, <laughs> I've come to help you. I think that shows his maliciousness. Oh, uh, uh, his total commitment uh, to maybe he didn't say it and to taking this victim uh, and to making sure that anyone who encounters him is not going to live. I'm looking. At but someone did encounter him and live. Her name was uh, Dylan Mortensen. I got a picture right now of Ethan and Zana, and you go into each of the victim's backgrounds painstakingly. And Zana had a just an upsetting background as a child. Both of her parents had been in and out of jail. And what does she do? She survives. She works harder <laughs> and a news flash. She didn't survive, bitch. <laughs> she said, out of all that, her parents were druggies and in and out of jail. What happens with Zanna? She survives. Knock knock. Get wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, these people will not stop. These people are going to keep grifting. They're going to keep doing, and, and that's the true definition of grifting. They know what they're saying is bullshit, and they're still saying it for money. At least I'm giving you truth for money, not much. Feel free to hit the links down below. Those people are making millions off of lying. Just making shit up. I stand by what I've been saying. Koberger... Innocent or guilty, there's not enough evidence to convict him. And let me tell you why I don't believe Bloom. If he had got something leaked from the grand jury, I'm pretty sure that Ann Taylor would have the jury grand jury dismissed. Let me explain this. If Howard Blum is telling the truth about information being leaked from the grand jury, the judge would have no choice but to dismiss the grand jury indictment. Legally, that would mean it was tampered with. Right or wrong? Guys, let me know in the comment section what you think. A lot of fuckery going on. I'm going to get this video up for you. I'll see you next time. Peace out.